Hello and welcome to Canada's History Spring webinar series. This series revolves around visual history and over the next few months we will hear from educators, public historians, and graphic designers who will speak about their experiences using visuals to share Canadian history. My name is Jessica Knapp and I will be your host for this series. Over the next hour, Bronwyn Graves and Rebecca Benson will sh discuss the history of the Aboriginal Arts and Stories contest and how they have consistently managed to encourage growth in the contest each year. Before we begin today's presentation, I'd like to provide you with a very quick introduction to Canada's National History Society. Canada's history is dedicated to promoting greater popular interest in Canadian history, principally through publishing, education, and recognition programs. If you are interested in knowing more about more or subscribing to our flagship publications, Canada's History Magazine and Kayak, Canada's History Magazine Kids, you can click on the links that are on the screen now and bookmark them for later. I also want to give a reminder, two reminders, those who are considering applying for the Government of Canada History Award through Canada's History. Um, this award is for teachers and students. The deadline is April 23rd, so that is just around the corner. There's a link on the screen there, that one's actually at the bottom of the screen if you want to go read up on that. And also, if you are a part of or know of a great community event, activity, or programming that commemorates important aspects of our heritage, apply or nominate it for the Governor General's History Award for Community Programming. That link is in the middle of the page. Uh, this deadline uh, for applications is June 30th, 2016, so you have a bit more time for that one but definitely something to start considering. So to ensure the best experience possible, I encourage you to close down an, any unnecessary programs or computers currently running. Uh, large programs like Photoshop uh, will might or has the possibility of slowing things down today. So uh, clean that up and uh, it'll be beautiful. But if it's not, we are recording to today's webinar and the recording should be available either later this afternoon or even tomorrow. And if you have registered for the webinar, you will get an email telling you when that recording is available. If you're on social media, you are encouraged to spread the word about today's conversation. I have included Canada's History's Facebook and Twitter links on the page. So if you haven't already, you can go on them and follow and like us there. And a little comment about questions for today. If you do have any questions during the webinar, you're welcome to ask them and Bronwyn and Rebecca will um, determine when to answer them. If they are also relevant to what they are discussing at that moment, they may choose to respond right away and otherwise they may choose to hold them off to the end and that is okay. It just means you have to stay with us all the way till the end, um, which is great for everybody involved. So a quick introduction to Bronwyn and Rebecca. Bronwyn is currently the Education Manager at Historica Canada. She draws on her experiences as a history teacher while working with the National Office Programs to create learning tools that will challenge students to think critically about Canada's history. Bronwyn holds an Honours BA from the University of Toronto, a Bachelor's in Education from OC, the University of Toronto, and a Master's degree in Medieval and Modern Languages from Oxford. Rebecca is the program coordinator for Aboriginal Arts and Stories. She received her master's degree, master's in art, art history from Queen's University, and previous to working at Historica, completed a research fellowship with the Museum of Healthcare addressing the cultural appropriation of indigenous medicines by early pharmaceutical companies, which sounds fascinating, and I'm going to have a discussion with Rebecca about that later on. She is Tuscarora from Six Nations of the Grand River, a proud student of, and I tried to practice saying this, but I'm going to let Rebecca tell us how to pronounce the Mohawk language in the Mohawk language uh, when she joins us. And she is fiercely committed to the revitalization of indigenous culture through, throughout Turtle Island. So now I would like to to welcome Rebecca and Bronwyn to join me as I upload their presentation.
Hello. Uh, I hope everybody can hear us. Uh, this is Rebecca speaking. Can everyone hear us okay? Okay, perfect. Excellent. Great. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Uh, yeah. So we we are the Aboriginal Arts and Stories team. Uh, we just want to begin by acknowledging that the Historica Canada offices are located in downtown Toronto. Uh, and Toronto, or Dugalundo, as it is in Anishinaabe, uh, is the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat and Petun First Nations, the Seneca, the Haudenosaunee, and most recently the Mississaugas of New Credit. I always like to acknowledge also that this territory is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant which is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Uh, so it's a really beautiful wampum that we all get to live under. Uh, so, And I also just acknowledge that you're all in different territories across the country, uh, and each of those territories is going to have its own unique Indigenous history, and I encourage you to investigate that. Um, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today to talk about Aboriginal Arts and Stories. I'm Bronwyn. I'm the Program Manager on Aboriginal Arts and Stories. I've worked at Historica for about five years, and I've been managing this program for, I think this is my third year on the program. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with it, Aboriginal Arts and Stories is a contest for all self-identities, identities, sorry, all self-identified First Nations, Métis, and Inuit youth, status and non-status, between the ages of 9 and 29. Um, the program encourages Indigenous youth from across the country to write a short story, um, a script, any sort of creative writing, or create any sort of two-dimensional art to explore a moment in their history or culture. So it's a very open-ended contest. Uh, you'll notice that uh, I stressed, and I stressed in the PowerPoint as well, that um, both status and non-status youth are welcome to take part in the program. And uh, in terms of the confines, uh, we try and uh, keep that wide open as well. So it can be any form of creative writing um, or any form of two-dimensional art that explores an issue or theme in Aboriginal history or culture. Uh, our goal with this project is to try and create a space for Indigenous youth to um, explore issues, to find their voices, and uh, for us to showcase the talents of um, the many Aboriginal youth across the country. So. The program runs um, consecutively year in, year out. Uh, every year, March 31st is the close deadline. Uh, and then April 1st is the uh, opening day for the new program year. So we are always accepting submissions. Uh, Historica Canada's partnership with Canada's History has allowed Aboriginal Arts and Stories winners to repeatedly attend the Governor General's History Award ceremony. And it happens every year in Ottawa in October. And it's a personal favorite of ours because uh, when the other times that we get to have all of the winners together, we're also doing a lot of logistical work. So for the Gigi's, it's like so much fun because we actually just get to spend time with the winners uh, and it gives them an opportunity to cement their connections with one another. And like over dinner last year, for example, they were like talking about making a graphic novel, all four of them, and it was really, really heartwarming. So last year uh, it gave uh, Sunshine O'Donovan and Shaylin Johnson, who are uh, our writing winners, and Mary McPherson and Isaac Narciso Weber. Uh, the chances to go, the chance to go to the GGs as well. So we are just really grateful for that opportunity. So Aboriginal Arts and Stories is one of our longest-standing programs at Historica. It began in 2004 as the Canadian Aboriginal Writing and Arts, or sorry, Canadian Aboriginal Writing Challenge, uh, and it was a short story contest initially. But then uh, it was so popular that it expanded. We included um, two-dimensional art in 2010, and it became the Canadian Aboriginal Writing and Arts Challenge. And then because that was a little bit of a mouthful, um, the program was rebranded and uh, renamed in 2014. Um, each year, we have seen incredible growth in this contest. It is not only the longest standing contest, um, student or youth-oriented contest that Historica runs, but it's also 
one of them is it sees the most consistent growth. Every year we see in the neighborhood of a 15 to 25% growth in this program, which is something that we're tremendously proud of from a personal perspective, but also that really speaks to the importance of uh, providing a platform for Indigenous youth to explore their voices and um, how important that is to them. And the way that we entice the youth <laughs> is through a really wonderful prize structure. So our top finalists receive cash prizes of up to $2,000 and then it's gradations of amounts that go down from there. Their writing is published in Canada's History magazine. Winners each year receive an all-expenses paid trip to a major Canadian city for a special reception. So last year it was in Toronto. Uh, this year it's going to be in Hamilton. And for 2015, 2016, uh, this year, we're very excited because we have two amazing prizes that are brand new. The BAM Center is going to provide our senior writing winner with a writer's residency for a week. And the Indigenous Visual Culture Program at OCAD University is going to provide like a professional development experience for the senior art winner, including an all access paid trip to Toronto, uh, which is really exciting. And it's really fun for us to try to move the pricing towards things that are really professional development focused and that will help create lasting bonds for our finalists with the art community. Um, and we also try to include uh, our, the art of our finalists in exhibitions. So really, it was really, really special. Last June, uh, we participated in the opening reception of the Pan Am Games Aboriginal Pavilion, and that was like Indigenous leaders from all over the country got to see the art of our finalists. Every year we have uh, an exhibition with OKT Law Firm, uh, which is an Indigenous focused law firm, and that's really special because uh, that law firm has a world class art collection and, and it's full of people who work really hard for Indigenous rights. And it's great because our finalist art is like up on the law school to see every day. And, and there have even ca been cases where the lawyers will buy the art. Um, so it's just like a really, and then that's something that the winners get to put on their resume, that they get to participate in these exhibitions and that their work has been sold. So we, we really love that. So the program could not exist without our um, dedicated and absolutely wonderful uh, judging panel. Um, their names are on the screen. Uh, we have a writing advisory committee and an arts advisory committee of uh, a who's who of Aboriginal writers and artists from coast to coast. And we are very fortunate to have their support. Um, they select the winners in both categories, um, arts and writing, and in both uh, the senior writing and uh, junior writing, senior arts, junior arts categories. And um, also, uh, as we've made big decisions moving forward, they've been um, a great community for us to rely on, giving us advice in major program decisions. And oh, oh, there nice. we go. There we go. Yeah, in last year was really, really special because our award ceremony actually took place in the Gallery Italia at the Art Gallery of Ontario. Uh, and we had Juno Award winning folk rock duo Digging Roots perform. And we ended up having a round dance in the Galleria Italia, which we're pretty sure is the first one in that room's history, at least. Um, although I'm not sure about the AGO as, as an entity. Uh, and it, it's the award ceremony is really, really special every year because it gives us a chance to uh, bring everybody together with the judges. So to clarify, um, the uh, ceremony that's on the screen right now that took place this past year in the AGO is the um, first of two that our winners get to go to where we announce the winners formally. And um, the actual reception takes place at the Governor General's Awards, which uh, you saw on a previous screen. So uh, as this program is now over a decade old, um, we do have a variety of funders who've been with us over the years and uh, currently the program is funded by the government of Canada plus a series of private funders who uh, all support us in different ways, some uh, in kind and some uh, provide monetary funding to uh, help make this program viable. So each year we accept creative writing in a wide variety of formats. 
we're always amazed at how creative the submissions are each year and that even just the different formats that we receive. So some of them are like fictional autobiographies and biographies. People will retell the lives of famous indigenous historical figures or even elders that they know personally or members of their family will receive letter writing entries, journal entries, newspaper articles where indigenous youth will uh, explain a current event or a historical event uh, from their own perspective uh, and give their own hot take. And we really love to see those. We get a lot of short stories and really heartfelt, beautiful poetry. We started to get song lyrics and rap lyrics. And we always see a few really creative screenplays and scripts that are just spectacular. A few years ago, we had one winner, Nicole in the Nordlock, who submitted a screenplay and she reinterpreted an Inuit myth as like a horror film. And it was it's spectacular. You can check it out on our website. Uh, we It's just amazing to see how creative uh, everybody is every year. Uh, and then really popular topics are like a retelling of a myth or a legend, um, talking about like a family tradition or a memory from someone's family. We always get some stories from specific communities. So one of our winners last year, Sunshine O'Donovan, uh, told the story uh, of her own community's history uh, in Merritt, BC, where there was uh, a mudslide that was caused while the railroad was being built that decimated the local salmon population. So Sunshine really dug into the emotional effects that that had on the community in terms of being able to provide for themselves. And that's something that happened like well over 100 years ago. So that's really, really cool. Uh, and we love to see Indigenous youth engaging with history in such a, an involved way. Uh, we'll, we'll have people talk about a current event or a current issue that has affected them. And they'll interpret that in a really, really personal way. So it's amazing. We also get 2D visual art submissions. So photographs, collage, painting, drawing, and multimedia. And then increasingly, because we have, we have a 2D art rule, and this is simply because our office cannot hold large sculptures, uh, and we cannot also ensure that sculptures and like large art pieces will be shipped safely. Like if someone wants to send us all the pieces of an installation, we just don't have the capacity to ensure that we can have that shipped safely and keep that safe and display it appropriately. So but something that's really interesting is the way that people will, like the youth will submit traditional activities like powwow dancing or carving or beading through like artfully taken photographs or they'll do a painting that features them uh, or they'll tell a story about one of about what that means to them. Uh, and that just everyone's ability to assert traditional activity within the con like the necessary confines of the contest uh, is really, really wonderful to see. So something that I started doing this year, because I understand it's it can be really overwhelming and daunting for for especially for a, anyone who doesn't feel they're specifically creative to kind of sit down with a blank piece of paper to try to write or create art. So uh, I do encourage youth to submit things that they've already created from class or to use school as like a stepping off point uh, to creating a submission for the contest. And we do encourage like if someone's taking art classes, they, they can uh, submit art that they've made for class if it's relevant to indigenous culture, history or their identity. Um, but some other ideas are like taking excerpts from an essay that they wrote about indigenous history or culture or politics. Uh, and I'll encourage youth also that, you know, in an academic paper, you don't always get to say how you feel about something. So I'll encourage them to use our contest as a platform for that and that they could create a submission from an essay uh, that is a little bit more personal. Uh, or that they could create a play out of a conversation that they had in a lecture or a seminar to talk about, to address like how indigenous issues are being talked about in the academy or in the classroom, uh, or that they could take their knowledge of a theory or a concept from like economics or political science or biology and tell a story about how it's impacting indigenous communities. Or like if you're learning about conservation and biology, 
um, connecting that to traditions you know about in your own community about conservation? Or like, if there is there a policy that you would change, like a political policy that you feel really strongly about? Um, I'll encourage them to write about that. So it's not it's not always necessarily like a creative writing or creative art piece. It doesn't have to be that. Um, and it's some of the really interesting submissions that we get are people who are addressing topics you wouldn't necessarily think of in relation to like a creative art and writing context. So the big challenge for us is how to create growth for the contest every single year. <laughs> so we try to aim for 15% growth minimum every year. And we've used several tactics over the years to increase the reach of our program so that it touches as many Indigenous youth as possible. And the first step towards growth was the addition of a two dimensional art as contest category. And even that is now having its boundaries pushed, as I just talked about. And in 2013, 2014, we added a third age category, uh, which was 11, ages 11 to 13. And then this year, we increased that age range category again, so that now it's 9 to 13. Uh, and increasingly, this just allows more and more youth uh, to submit to the contest. And the 9 to 13 age category specifically allows youth who are attending elementary schools and where teachers might have a little bit more time uh, to do art and writing with their class with a little less structure. Uh, and especially youth attending on-reserve elementary schools. We wanted to be able to target those communities uh, because we really want to see what they have to say. And our outreach occurs in really five key ways. Uh, each year we do a national marketing campaign and we use Aboriginal Link, uh, which sends out faxes and posters to post-secondary institutions and schools across the country. And we also use Indigenous pu publications across Canada to advertise for the contest. Uh, we try to do support local uh, papers and local media uh, where possible. Then we also attend conferences that focus on Indigenous educators. We are huge fans of INSPIRE. Uh, those are really wonderful conferences that we try to attend each year. And then I have gone across Canada this year doing workshops across the country. Uh, in community organizations, uh, as well as in schools, to try to encourage Indigenous youth to create art and writing that reflects their identity. So that looked that there were a few different really interesting connections that we got to make this year. While I was in Calgary, I did a workshop for a YMCA Aboriginal Buddies program, which is the only program of its kind in the country. Uh, when I was in Halifax and Dartmouth, we went to a lot of schools. So you also target your outreach to the kinds like how are Indigenous youth accessing services and accessing education and enrichment in their own communities. And you just try to find that out and serve that population as best as you can. Then we use educational email blasts and a telephone outreach campaign to connect with educators, school boards, on and off reserve schools, friendship centers, and community organizations. And then we really are trying to push social media. So we have Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram accounts that we use to try to connect with community members, educators, as well as Indigenous youth themselves. And we've seen a lot of social media growth in the last little while. And we, it's really fun to be able to engage in actual conversation uh, with folks through the social media channels. Now, there are communities that are underrepresented in our numbers each year. Uh, for example, we have trouble sometimes getting submissions from the East Coast. So we try to engage communities that historically have not engaged with the contest, and we try to look at those statistics really closely. So the way that we target an underrepresented community would be one of four ways. Uh, we'll try to, if possible at all, we'll try to plan an outreach visit because a huge part of this program is personal connection. And uh, I find it's really like in the workshops, I will tell my own story and it's really helpful for youth to sort of see me as someone who's like an urban indigenous person who has had my own identity journey. And I can share a little bit about that. Uh, and I think also like that means a lot to teachers 
that they're not alone in this, they're not alone and they have support in being able to submit to the contest. And also, I think it means a lot to see that there are organizations that are trying to win help them and trying to enrich indigenous education across the country outside of just like curriculum developments and all the hard work that teachers and educators do every day. Um, so we'll try to plan an outreach visit because that in-person contact is really, really important. We'll try to build a relationship with a local institution and provide them with local resources. So for example, we have, we're, we're building a relationship with a contact at Arctic College in Iqaluit and that's really helpful uh, in communities where understandably uh, information will maybe travel more mouth to mouth or people are going to be way more likely to submit to the contest if somebody that they know personally believes in the contest uh, and is aware of it themselves. So that's really helpful in a place like a Callaway to have somebody on the ground who is willing to talk about the contest and we'll try to provide them with any resources they need to help them with that. Then we also will market to local media outlets. So in an area that we see we're not getting high numbers from, we'll try to find like an indigenous local publication and market with them and then do targeted social media outreach to those to school boards um, and local community members. And then we'll also do follow up. Like follow up is really, really important um, in terms of just checking in and seeing how people are feeling about the contest and, and also to try to find out what the barriers are and why people aren't submitting. So that is how we try to target underrepresented communities. And then, unfor unfortunately, all the people that do submit to the contest cannot win. But uh, I do believe very strongly that there are strong and important outcomes for everybody who participates in the contest. We ensure that every person who participates receives a certificate of participation and that they have their submission acknowledged and their effort acknowledged. We stress the value of the contest as well as a motivational tool to encourage youth to create art. Uh, it's, it's not just about winning prizes, it's about uh, believing in the value of one's own vision and one's own story and that it's important and it's important enough for other people to see it. And then we highlight the value of submitting to the contest again if, if someone is not a finalist, um, because that has happened. There have been people who have submitted to the contest one year and not one, and then been a finalist the next year. That has absolutely happened. So we try to encourage that as much as possible as well. So when I'm doing workshops, I really do try to stress this idea that the contest matters as a motivational tool. A huge part of what we do uh, in our outreach uh, is, is just validating different indigenous identities. Uh, indigenous identity for, for youth is so complicated and we do speak to youth in all kinds of different contexts, be they urban or rural, reserve, off-reserve. Uh, and it's really important to stress that wherever someone's at in their indigenous identity, that that is valid and that their stories matter and that their stories are still indigenous stories, even if they aren't necessarily about the land uh, and that stories about why they don't maybe have a relationship to the land, that those are really important too. Um, I talk a lot about the value of storytelling in general and that um, we can, we learn and we share. Uh, stories and that's a really important part of indigenous culture and that stories help us see how our own personal struggles are both similar and unique. Uh, and then a really great part of the contest that I love so much now is actually the website because it is this amazing archive of all of our finalists since the beginning of the contest. And uh, I'm getting feedback now from educators, for example, like the Inspire Con Conference, that they're going to the website to talk to their classes about indigenous issues, or if they're in an English class teaching about an indigenous issue uh, and trying to inspire their students to write about that, that they'll go to our website for some inspiration. And it's really, really inspiring to know that people are looking to our website to see how indigenous youth are writing and reflecting on indigenous issues. Uh, and that it's actually like the website in and of itself has become like its own unique entity. Uh, apart from just the value of 
the contest uh, as like a motivational tool for you. So that is really what I try to stress a lot when I'm doing outreach because it's it's really complicated. It's more complex than just saying you should submit to this contest. Um, and often because my own identity journey um, isn't like a, like I didn't grow up on reserve and like I didn't necessarily have a relationship to my culture growing up and it's and youth so respond to that uh, and 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 it's really great to see that too and it it makes them feel validated and kind of brave in their own identities so that's a really key component of this contest so uh, the lucky few who are selected to be finalists for this program um, obviously receive some pretty spectacular prizes which we've detailed earlier but um, also it opens the door to further professional development opportunities. Uh, mentoring is something that we have really tried to stress moving forward. Um, but also there are some intangibles that I think a lot of people, um, a lot of the young people especially really value in terms of having their skills and their work uh, and their self-identity as a young artist or writer validated. Uh, we so often hear, you know, oh, I never really thought that what I was doing was particularly special or I just was playing around with this. I never really took my identity as a writer very seriously. And so I think probably the greatest gift that this program can give some of these kids is to, um, to let them know that yes, we're taking what they have to say very, very seriously. And that in terms is a huge motivator um, to continue their work in other forums or to submit to the contest again. Um, many of our participants, our finalists, uh, move on to creative careers, which uh, we love to see. It is really, really satisfying. Uh, to see uh, a young person grow into their art um, or their craft uh, and become exhibitors, um, independent artists or writers in their own right. So this is a great example. This is Zach Narciso Weber, who won last year. He was our first place winner for the 19 to 29 category. Uh, and our, and he uh, is graduating from OCAD U this year, uh, and he sells his work uh, at powwows and online, uh, and he is like a very significant member of Toronto's Indigenous artistic community. I think also his work winning was really poignant and special because what made the work Indigenous was the fact that it was his perspective as an urban Indigenous youth. Uh, and the judges talked a lot about that in the deliberation process. So it was really exciting for us to see something like this win. Uh, but Isaac is certainly someone to watch out for. And he also like he sells um, graffiti skateboards and like graffiti plywood pieces at powwows. And uh, we were we did some powwow outreach last year and it was so fun because I was there doing outreach and he was there selling his work. And I was like, we really should have organized our booths so they were next to each other. So I could be like, he's our winner. <laughs> like, um, and we could support each other. And he also is a great advocate for the program. Um, so Brandon Wilson's a, a great example of a young artist that we have been fortunate enough to see grow up. I think this is Brandon's fourth or fifth year entering the yeah. contest. So uh, his 2013 entry is up there. Uh, the young child featured in all of the pictures is uh, Brandon's little brother, actually. And each year, Brandon has taken pictures of his brother in a variety of di different contexts, different ways to um, explore the question of um, Aboriginal identity and youth. And it's been kind of, a, it's been a remarkable journey both to see Brandon's craft mature, um, but also we are literally watching his younger brother grow up before our eyes, which is, uh, I have to say, pretty special as well. Yeah, this is Brandon's piece from last year, which was a finalist again. So I often will talk about Brandon uh, when I do workshops across the country because I'll say, you know, this Brandon, <laughs> Brandon keeps winning. He keeps being a finalist. Um, and this is a really great example of how his work has kind of developed. So this piece specifically, he photographed not just his little brother, but also other members of his community holding words that related to their identity how they saw themselves or how they felt they were perceived by the world. Um, and yeah, it's just really special to watch them both grow. <laughs> and we love Brandon. He has submitted again this year, so we'll see. Um, so Joseph Tisaga is uh, another former winner who has uh, had a, a professional career that has just taken off. He's had a recent showing 
uh, in a gallery in Toronto. And uh, he is, if you, you can Google him online and see a lot of his other work, which has been pretty remarkable. He came from Whitehorse and um, recently actually came down to Toronto to film a video when we had our 10th anniversary. So you can find out a little bit more about him on our website by viewing that video. And this is uh, Sunshine O'Donovan's uh, artist state, author statement that I mentioned earlier. Sunshine is just a remarkable individual. Uh, she stars in a film uh, that was made by uh, a Swedish filmmaker who was filming in Merritt, BC. Uh, and Sunshine is just like she submitted again to the contest this year. She was on the film festival circuit. She is um, a champion sharpshooter. Uh, and she, there's, she's, she's so, so spectacular and definitely someone to watch both as a writer and as a thinker and uh, as an athlete uh, and an actor. So we're, it was really great to have Sunshine on board. A young woman of many talents. Yes. Um, so Shailen Johnson was our... Um, senior writing winner last year, and she's a, another remarkable young woman. She grew up on the Lower East Side of Vancouver and is now taking English at UBC and uh, writes a column for the Metro News in Vancouver. And she really credited her success in the program with giving her that confidence boost that she needed to um, go out and pursue other professional writing opportunities. Uh, she's also become an ambassador for the program, um, spreading the word within her community and to other young Aboriginal people in um, the Vancouver area, which is something that we love to see. So it we just we are excited to answer any of your questions, and it's it's such a wonderful experience for us to be able to support Indigenous youth in their creativity through this contest. It means a lot to me personally as an Indigenous person who has had like a very long Indigenous identity journey to be able to support youth across the country with that, even if it's just in this small way. Uh, and this year we received 630 submissions, which marks an 18% increase in comparison to last year. And last year we had a 25% increase and a record that was a record increase, record number of submissions by a mile. And it was quite a challenge for this year. And I, it's, we're so excited to see who the winners are this year. And that information will be available in early June. Check our website to see who the new writers and the new artists are that are finalists uh, and who gets to go to the BAMP Center and who gets to go to OCADU. And we are just very hopeful that the contest is going to have a bright future. So does anybody have any questions? Uh, we can move into the question and answer period. Thank you, Bronwyn and Rebecca, for your presentation. I learned so much about this competition, this contest that I had not known before. And uh, I think it's really important even for us as uh, supporters of the contest, for all our staff to know everything you just shared with us today. Um, I'll start the, oh, I was going to start, but Elka totally beat me to it. Um, so her question there is, do you know if any of your young artists have also been nominated for the Sobe Art Award? N not yet. Um, I, I, I think I, there's probably a few that I would hope at some point over the course of their career, I would love to see them nominated. And I think when their art gets to a certain level, will absolutely be worthy of such an award, but that has not happened yet. But that's a really good question. Um, no, none that we have been made aware of. I will say something we do have trouble with, and it's just the nature of doing outreach and working with teenagers and young adults whose lives are uh, very busy uh, and also somewhat um, in transition because if you're dealing with people who are in high school and then they go to university, we actually have trouble keeping tabs on some of our winners. Um, but we love, we always encourage them to update us. So we haven't heard of any lar like large scale awards, but Joseph, like, 
being given a show with Diaz Contemporary is a very significant achievement. And we've certainly had artists had their work being exhibited in like significant exhibitions as well. I know Shaylin mentioned to me um, part of her work is going to be published in an English textbook uh, addressing the history of residential schools, I believe. So uh, big professional building achievements, but no awards that I know of. We did also have a winner, um, I think it was two or three years ago, who um, was offered a, a book deal as well after winning um, to write a children's story based on her entry. You're so welcome. Thank you for, those are really great questions. What incredible accomplishments, uh, an art gallery, book, education, publications, those are just incredible. Um, so speaking of the success of your uh, recipients, what ways do you see the program expanding into the future? We are hoping to, oh, well, long-term dreams of ours uh, are to maybe one day have a music category. Uh, that would be something that we would love to see because there's so much amazing music being made by Indigenous youth across the country, and there is better access now than ever before to sort of ways of recording that. Uh, we also really hope to maybe accommodate like video art. Uh, it's really hard. The sculpture is really difficult and traditional art forms are really difficult to accommodate, but like always working towards coming up with creative ways of maybe having them be featured in the contest because those art forms are so important to us. Um, we'd like to, in terms of um, furthering the reach, one thing um, that sort of builds on the uh, relationship that we have with, with Shailen and a few of our other past winners who stay ambassadors is to try and uh, connect with people who are working with Aboriginal youth in some way um, and then sort of a train the trainer because uh, Rebecca does really fabulous workshops, but there's only one of her and uh, realistically I, she does have to come home sometimes. So we can't let her travel coast to coast. Um, it would be great to set up a model where we have previous winners or um, other educators working with Aboriginal youth who could um, use the storytelling workshop model that we've developed within their own communities. So I see that Audrey's asked uh, two questions. One is uh, what motivates you in this important job? And two is how can we encourage your mission? Do you want to speak to one and I'll speak to the other? I'm happy to talk about motivation. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> motivation for me. I can't think of anything more motivating than being able to inspire the indigenous youth of tomorrow. Uh, like this, like my master's is in art history and I've worked with indigenous youth for a really long time now for a great many years. And I just feel like the lucky, like I come to work motivated and excited every single day. And if I ever uh, like lose focus on that, it's just so easy to like, look at the amazing art and writing on our website and look at our submission numbers come in through the back end of our website and uh, I'll get phone calls from parents across the country. Um, like I got a, a number of phone calls this year from foster parents asking if it was okay for them to, to sign the parental permission slip, which it, it absolutely was, but just, and, and having them, you know, tell me a little bit about the, their child and, telling me their child's story and how much it met, means to their child to submit to the contest and how excited they are. Um, it's very easy to be motivated when I'm like going on workshops because like seeing Indigenous youth um, talk about their identity and talk about things that they've been through and get excited about their identity and get excited about the road that they're on is just the best motivation in the world. And it's very, it's actually emotionally, it's very emotional work for me. <laughs> um, uh, and, and I think it's like, that's only just like, I think 
it's inevitable because the, the writing and art submissions are just so spectacular. Uh, it's really, really, really important work right now too. Um, in terms of uh, encouraging and supporting the work that we're trying to do on the program, um, the number one thing is always just spreading the word. Um, we have a solid outreach plan that Rebecca out, uh, laid out for you and, and talked you through, but um, as always, uh, just making sure that I would love it if every Aboriginal youth in the country at least knew the program and this opportunity existed for them. Um, so outreach is key. Tell all your friends. Tell yeah. your friends' friends. <laughs> yeah, and we have social media, so you can share our stuff through Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Um, and that's also like, feel free to ask us questions on social media or if there's um, something having to do with Indigenous art or writing, like feel free to engage with us on social media about that. Because um, we're always... That's a really fun part of the job is getting to engage with the community through the internet. So if anyone's interested in finding us on Facebook, um, you can look up Aboriginal Arts and Stories. Oh, Elka's just asking exactly that question yes. and um, on Twitter we can be found uh, under Abor Arts Stories mm -hmm. um, and then you can also find us on Instagram the same name yeah oh oh my gosh genius yeah Facebook Twitter and Instagram um, Rebecca is just typing in where what you can find us um are the handle out for our twitter and for instagram yeah if you just search aboriginal Arts stories on facebook will come up and then our tag on instagram is i believe the same. yeah excellent thank you for sharing that information and I should be able to share it in the email that goes out with you recording as well to make sure everybody can connect with you there. Uh, we've had a lot of opportunity to talk about successes. I was wondering if you could speak to some of the challenges of doing outreach to Indigenous youth for a contest that is a national scope. Um, I think first of all Rebecca mentioned there is a general challenge in doing outreach to youth in terms of um, trying to connect with them. Um, teenagers can be difficult to reach in a way that's meaningful for them, so we rely heavily on social media for that. Um, but also just uh, the fact that you know teenagers often do change their um, email addresses quite frequently, um, so sometimes getting in touch with past winners can be difficult if they've changed their name as they've outgrown a previous one or perhaps they are no longer at the same educational institution. So that can be one uh, challenge. Another is just the sheer size of this country um, and the fact that community connections are so very important. So I feel like um, our best and most meaningful connections have been those that have been developed through Rebecca's visits um, to various community groups. And um, realistically, because uh, we are a team of two, it can be, uh, we just don't have the capacity for uh, someone to go and meet everyone face to face as much as we'd like to. Yeah, it's very important for us to have, uh, and we, we really accept feedback as well. Like if someone has a critique of the contest, we try to really take those into consideration. But there is nothing more meaningful to us than when an educator or a community leader or an elder really believes in the contest. Um, on a personal level and will promote it from that perspective uh, and where it's really coming from the heart because I think that comes across and educators get so excited because they just want their students to have all the opportunities in the world so it's also just about spreading the word and we do that in as many ways as we can but again those personal connections are really like the most important and the most effective in terms of actually getting people to submit the work and being able to actually have access to the opportunities that the contest can provide so that is a hefty challenge <laughs> <laughs> does anyone have any other questions
while people are thinking about that, I do want to say thank you very much, Bronwyn and Rebecca, for your presentation and uh, for working with me and making making today happen. Oh, we were very happy to. We're always happy to talk about this program. Yeah, and this was a really fun experience uh, putting this together and being able to share outreach in this in this way. I think actually I'm thinking about how we can use this for the contest <laughs> for outreach. Certainly, yeah, it's it was a really great opportunity to take stock. Excellent. So awesome. thank you. We can and wrap up today. We have many thank yous and uh, uh, comments on a very great presentation. Thank you everyone for joining us today for the webinar about Historica Canada's Aboriginal Arts and Stories competition. I am sending a link now to a survey that you can give us feedback on today's presentation and all our webinars eventually end up on there so at any given time you uh, can use this link to come back and uh, provide feedback for us. I do want to mention that in two weeks, Tom Morton will tell you how to exploit the power of visual sources to create curiosity and teach historical thinking. Um, also in a webinar format, that one will be later in the afternoon. And with that, I'd like to wish everybody to have a great day. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.